thank you miss mina hina habib you all, you always bring uh, fresh air to our conversations and thank you, you talked about uh, many things okay uh, well, i i want to take this opportunity to just uh, thank you to mr azim saab and musawir for um, given me this opportunity because uh, i think this has helped a lot um, uh, uh helped a lot uh, uh, so i think this opportunity and this thing should be continue and um i I'll, i'll definitely appreciate them uh, for this and um, i just want to be a part of any such opportunity in future as well and i'm very thankful to you uh, to the organizers and the participants as well thank you thank you miss hina habib again and just to reflect upon what a few things that you mentioned in your conversation you talked about uh, uh, the national identity and that is of course a very important national identity and national uh, cohesion um, there is one instance when we all look as a nation and that is when we are having uh, india pakistan cricket match so we we are we are no Uh, there is no division among us at that time and we are one and we are just pakistanis so if i give an example of china they have also their different ethnicities over there but once their um, political stability was ensured uh, and they started to develop themselves economically so they they rise you could see now i mean they started to rise and now they are uh, emerging superpower of the world at the same time i also agree that uh, one um, model uh, of growth or uh, democracy perhaps cannot be totally uh, copied or replicated because every country has its own realities has its own culture and that's the same case with uh, western type of democracies when they criticize the chinese democracy so while china has never criticized western democracy so the fact is that one size doesn't fits all and that is the message from your conversation so now we will move to our next speaker um Mr. Zamir Asadi, he is also waiting anxiously, and I can see his happy face. Over to you, Mr. Zamir Asadi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shams Bhai, and thank you very much once again for the organizers. And uh, first time I have uh, listened to our very uh, respected uh, sinologist, uh, Madam, who have given a very a comprehensive brief uh, about the chinese economic development model and the success of the china story as far as their achievements in terms of economy and development are concerned and the lessons that we can get uh, to uh, so it was really a pleasure and uh, a good uh, to listen to the respected professor so um, being a journalist i would also like to uh share some of uh, my opinion and expressions of uh, how how china have uh, you know um, gained its economic achievement and what what china is offering uh, from its economic achievements uh, to its uh, partners especially to the developing country china is also uh, itself a developing country the largest developing country that is uh, you know driving a force of the economic development in many of the countries and the region and it's also the second largest economy of the world so the developing countries they feel very proud they feel very trusted and they feel very confident while dealing with china while partnering with china because china like other developing countries is also uh, in uh, is a developing country and and in the phase of uh, getting the absolute uh, development the sustainable development uh, that's why the developing countries uh, 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 they they would they always love to uh, partner with china so i think china um, has the world's fastest uh, growing uh, you know major economy uh, with growth rates averaging 10% uh, 
over 30 years. And uh, since the 12th National Congress of the Chinese Communist Party in 1982, the economy has been described as socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics. So we have to see that uh, China has introduced an other uh, market economy system uh, as compared to the uh, Western uh, you know, economic uh, systems that have always governed um, and they, uh, the, those models, uh, they only minted money for themselves. Uh, they didn't care about their partners, but China, uh, with the you know uh, introduction of the socialist market economy with Chinese characteristics, especially, um, have offered many things uh, to the developing countries and to the to its partner partner countries. So these Chinese characteristics um, have got the attention of many um, uh, countries and the international institutions as well. Uh, because what, what, uh, we have to understand what are the Chinese characteristics. The Chinese characteristics are always about the win-win situation, the mutual consultation, and the meaningful consultation. So the the the, 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 the partner countries, are those who are uh, you know uh, uh, joining hands with China, they feel a uh, very secure while dealing with China. They do not have any doubts in their mind that China will be attaching and any kind of political strings while offering um, uh, the economic assistance. So these Chinese characteristics uh, are very unique and uh, have uh, you know given a very uh, a different position to China. So China's development model is based as an alternative to the Western free market based approach. So I think China's rapid growth in the past three decades has widely uh, upend the idea that the Western new liberal ideology uh, would spread interna uh, internationally unimpeded. The pace of economic change in China has been extraordinarily uh, rapid since the start of the economic reforms over 25 years ago. Its ec economy has undergone a massive, I think, transformation and is now um, uh, 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 now getting the attention uh, from the international financial institutions as well. So it has shifted from a predominantly agricultural one to becoming an industrial uh, powerhouse and is now for more several you know, service oriented. So these are the phases uh, uh, about the economic development of China. Uh, that uh, Starting from, uh, you can say the agricultural development are uh, moving towards the industrial development and then now they are more, you know, service uh, oriented. So uh, uh, China has always transformed as per the needs of the international community and as per the needs of the domestic consumption. So I think that the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, development model is based on continuous and selective state interventions in markets and firms with the objective of shaping the course of economic development. So China, as a um, as a government, as a state, has also helped its, you know, state and institutions to grow. Uh, it has also invested. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the the major finances and it has uh, also you know you can say help the uh, state institutions and the private institutions uh, in terms of the financial assistance and they, they, a lot of uh, the subsidies uh, in various sectors have been you know introduced by the Chinese government and they have never <clears throat> you can say categorized um, uh, among uh, the, the state and the private institution they have dealt um, in a very balanced manner. So I think the, uh, during the early 1970s, China was economically isolated and in, and in a situation where it faced several you know, threats from the then two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. But today, the debate revolves around how far Chinese ideas could spread. You know, this is very interesting. There was a time in 1960s and 70s when the Americans and the, and the Soviets and the other European countries their economic ideas were uh, dominant, and the world was talking about uh, those ideas. And the, and even if you are not talking about uh, <clears throat> being a developing country, you do not have you were not having any other option. So, but after the uh, that seventies, eighties, nineties, and after that uh, two thousand in the new century, just in thirty or forty years, we see that the Chinese economic ideas are now. Uh, uh, becoming dominant and the international community is talking about these Chinese characteristics and the Chinese economic uh, development model. So we have, this is a lesson for all of us that if you are committed 
uh, uh, for the uh, 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 by, uh, with, uh, with the introduction of the reforms uh, for your domestic market and for the international market, then uh, it doesn't take time. And you get more and more benefits for yourself and for your partner countries as well. So this is the story of China. And just last 40 years after the reforms and the opening of policies, that now China has become a major power and the economic uh, powerhouse for the world and the Americans. And now you see that President Xi Jinping is on a very significant and the important visit of Saudi Arabia. The first time we have seen that there is a huge diplomatic activity in the Arab continent. And what is that? That the leader of a, an economic powerhouse is there in Saudi Arabia. And all of that, the major Arab leaders are there to meet with that, uh, that leader of a country that is now the second largest economy of the world. So it is the success of the Chinese economic development model. It is the success of non-aggression economic development achievements of China. So why that's why Americans and the Westerns, they are very confused and they are very, you know, in, in, in a uh, the state of mind, they, they, they're, they're very shocked that how did it happen? That all of the Arab leaders, they are there in Saudi Arabia, the Qatar leader, the Kuwait leader, the, the Bahrain, the UAE, and the Misr, well, you name it, and the Arab leaders are there. This is the first time the China Arab uh, summit is held and it has gained the attention from the international community, from the international media as well. The BBC, the CNN, the New York Times, Washington, they are all talking about it, that how did it happen this in 40 years. Now the focus of the, 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 the diplomacy of the Arabs and the China, China has already changed itself and now the uh, diplomacy of the Arabs are changing because, you know, and it also shows that what is the, you know, um, you can say whose uh, um, economic development models are going to uh, dominate in the international arena in the coming years. So the, the gathering of China and Arab leaders, they, it, it just tells us that the international stage, international arena is changing. And so you, also, you must also have to change. Pakistan is a very lucky country that Pakistan is also having a very good relationship with China enjoys a very good relationship with the Arab countries and now it is there in between with China and the Arab, Arab countries. So Arab countries and China, they are already a huge investors of the Pakistani market, in the Pakistani market. China has invested more than $19 billion in the CPAC phase one in Pakistan. And the Saudi Arab and no doubt and the UAE and other uh, Arab countries, they are always very interested in investing in Pakistani market as a, as a, by, by considering as an Islamic brotherhood. So it is a very golden opportunity for Pakistan as well uh, that it can cultivate, it can gain more from the alliances of China and Arab states. So we are blessed, I think, with this uh, very good opportunity. But it is uh, the, the, the Hina Habib and our professor was talking about that. Well, now the, the opportunity is there, but in terms of the political instability, we, we are lacking a lot of things. If we do not, you know, establish the political instability, then definitely. We, are, we will be the losers. We will be the losers and, and I think the history will not, uh, you know, you can say, um, will not give us any other chance. You know, we have a good chances with CPAC, with China, Arab alliances. So Pakistan is there to cultivate. So I think, uh, um, and, and then the Chinese, China's reforms have undoubtedly resulted in fast and continuous growth in the past three decades and have also lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. So there, there are lessons. There are lessons around us in Arab countries, in China. Uh, how it, it, it is just a period of 40 years for the Arab countries as well. Although they 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 they, uh, they got the, uh, the, the they got the uh, oil, uh, but uh, but China China was not having any you know oil fields. What they did, they just worked hard on different ideas. So I think the lessons of there, China have done a beautiful and a great job in terms of the poverty alleviation. Uh, Arab countries have also done that. Uh, the poverty alleviation, you cannot uh, see the, the, the poor people in the major Arab countries. Uh, they are also uh, providing a very good, uh, prosperous life, the, the sustainable life to their people. So we have many things to learn from our neighboring countries. But the need of the time is that how we can learn. Uh, 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 whether we are interested in it, whether we are interested in it, 
because in the last uh, 20 years when we were uh, 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 grooming ourselves and <clears throat> we were opening an eyes in in the colleges and the university we were going there we were always studying the pakistan is passing through a very critical stage and now uh, after 20 years we are you know again seriously this sentence is there in our mind pakistan is going through a very critical stage of the history when this critical stage will you know uh, pass away i think never it will not pass because our policies our economic stability our political stability uh, it's 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 a dream maybe when we will be fighting politically we cannot get anything positive so for years the united states uh, has used its hegemonic power and influence in the world bank and international monetary fund to guide developing countries towards capitalism and liberal democracy the the western they did it through world bank and international monetary fund but with the passage of the time china did, china made made, made its face uh, china you know uh, it came on the world stage with its reforms and opening of policies and china did not introduce uh, such kind of idea to suppress the countries through imf and world bank uh, they, they, they 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 have different uh, you know uh, models and approaches towards the economic uh, cooperation uh, with their partner countries so i think the scenario is changing now internationally regionally the political the economic the diplomacy uh, the scenarios are changing and is it is the time for i think i, I again I, i say again and again that pakistan should understand that where we are standing the scenarios are changing you cannot depend on the westerns and the americans all the time now you you should have to come out of that um, uh, gora supremacy uh, that you are always in love with they have they have not uh, given you anything in terms of the economic uh, you know assistance you just check the figures of the americans and the westerns what they have invested in the last uh, you know 5 or 7 years in pakistan i think only millions of dollars but the chinese have invested 19 billions of dollars the chinese in investment uh, under cpac phase 1 is huge and huge no other country can match uh, you know this type of huge investment in pakistan in the last 5 to 7 years so i think as a result in 2015 more than 50 countries decided to join the asian infrastructure investment bank led by china so beijing has um, a stake of approximately 30% uh, in the new institution so Uh, why these uh, you know uh, the bank asian infrastructure investment bank the silk road economic fund and the silk uh, the brics bank a new development bank uh, that was uh, you know initiated by the brics why these the banks are getting more and more membership because the western liberal democratic uh, system uh, of uh, the, of suppressing the countries through world bank and imf they, it's going to collapse so international countries they are understanding the situation that's why they are uh, you know becoming a uh, member of these institutions that are uh, you know um, in, uh, financial institutions that are led by china developed by china with the mutual and the meaningful consultation of its partner countries it's, it's not only the chinese banks these are the financial institutions international financial institutions but are led by china because it's a major investor or it's a major major funder of these banks so in recent years china has become a potential competitor to the western liberal democracy and has been evolving into a soft uh, uh, soft state so the chinese development model which includes a strong role of the state a focus of investment and export oriented economy has produced around four decades of phenomenal growth however i think there has been a noticeable slowdown ever since the global financial crisis of uh, 2008 the chinese development model mainly you know incorporates political and economic policies of china that were instituted by uh, tang shaoping mr uh, shams was um, uh, uh, talking about it the um, tang shaoping have a major major role um, um, uh, uh, of new china or the uh, developed china that what we are witnessing today mr tang shaoping is, is is a miracle for china that he is the founder of Uh, the china that we are witnessing today and we want to collaborate with that china this the, the i think the foundation of that china was that laid by that tang shaoping so every um, uh, frankly speaking the every chinese leader like after tang shaoping there was uh, i think uh, jiang zemin and uh, then uh, hu jintao wen jiabao mr xi jinping everyone has its own role of development the interesting thing is that every president played the role every president although introduced its own development you know 
models, Mr. Like President Xi Jinping introduced a Belt and Road Initiative. So, but those models they really delivered. That was these models were not self-oriented for China. These were the models that that was oriented to people uh, centered models and the internationally centered models that uh, and that were getting the attention from the international community. Uh, so I think uh, uh, that the Chinese development model mainly incorporates political and economic policies of China that was uh, you know instituted by Tang Xiaoping after uh, Mao Zedong's death in 1976. So I think uh, these policies have further contributed to China's economic character and growth in gross uh, you know national product. Um, Joshua Cooper Ramo, the CEO and the vice chairman of the Kissinger Association. I, it's very important. I am sharing with you the Kissinger Associates and uh, best-selling author uh, coined the phrase "Beijing Consensus." The title of his book, published in 20, uh, 2009, for the development model for the developing countries, meant to be an alternative to the Washington Consensus of market-friendly policies promoted by the IMF and World Bank. Even the American scholars they are forced to write that the the the, 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 the these uh, you know. Uh, models introduced by America and the Westerns, they are, they will not, they will be, uh, you know, you can say, uh, 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 they will not, that will, will not be seen in the coming years. So this author has predicted in 2009 that Beijing consensus is now, uh, you know, getting more and more influence and getting more and more uh, uh, um, attention of the international community. The idea of the BRI was not there publicly in 2009, but it predicted that the Beijing consensus and the Beijing economic model uh, will be uh, making its more and more space at the international arena. So it's happening now. So another Daniel Bell, an American sociologist and Harvard professor, um, has argued that Westerners tend to divide the political world into good democracies and bad, uh, you know, democracies. So they have their own uh, conceptual model to divide the world, the good democracy, bad democracy, authoritarianism, good authoritarianism, bad authoritarianism. So what authoritarianism is good or what is bad? Authoritarianism is authoritarianism. But whatever they like about it, they, they divide the world. These are the tactics, tactics of dividing the world uh, economically and politically and to rule. So these are very interesting things. Over the decades, I think China has evolved a political system that can best be described a political, uh, you can say, the, the democracy. Because it has delivered for its people uh, in terms of politically, in terms of economically, in terms of education, in terms of health, in, in, in terms of a social welfare state. The Chinese system, what they have developed, it was as per their need, local needs. It, 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 it was... As per their, uh, the, uh, the aspirations of the Chinese government. So I think every country, you know, they have, uh, they, they, they should develop their own system. The Chinese have done that. I think uh, the international community that, that does not have the authority to, uh, to criticize or to, uh, or to comment negatively on their system. They should, I think the international community should have to focus to improve uh, their systems. That how they can, you know, deliver uh, in the best manner for their public. The Chinese system have delivered for their public. Uh, but many of the people who are here in this uh, you know, session, many of the people have a very good opportunity of spending a very good time in China. Mr. Shams, uh, Mr. Azim and other our friends, they have spent a very good time in, uh, as a student and as a professional. So we have, I have also spent a very good time in China. We have witnessed that how the Chinese economic system, the political system is, is working and delivering um, benefits for its people. The people, the, the, uh, either they are students, either they are uh, medical, you know, either they are doctors, they are teachers, they are engineers, or they are professional from any of the sector. They are satisfied with the, with the policies of the Chinese government. And they always, you know, love and they always stand with their uh, Chinese leadership. Whoever is the president, they, they are confident that the Chinese leadership is going to deliver for themselves and they, the Chinese leadership is, you know, um, uh, offering good opportunities for the international community as well. So there are many things that we can talk about about this Chinese economic system. I have uh, many things uh, that uh, I, I took the notice for this uh, session, but I think uh, the time is very short, about 6 o'clock. 
so i think uh, pakistan is uh, being a very good brotherly and a neighboring country uh, must uh, you know cultivate more and more opportunities of development uh, from china uh, we are a very lucky country that under belt and road initiative we have cpac and 19 billion dollars of investment under cpac have been done in pakistan and more than i think uh, 15 to 20 billion dollars investment is there in the pipeline and there are many more investment opportunities are coming from china to pakistan uh, li like uh, as far as the industrial development is concerned only russia ka economic zone have the potential to, uh, to you can say to uh, to gain maximum and maximum investment from china so all of these 8 to 10 industrial zones uh, if pakistan uh, gets the successful uh, initiation and the successful completion of these industrial zones and billions of dollars will be coming from china and the international community uh, for the for the economic development and for the industrial development of pakistan so i think it is a time uh, again what our professor have talked about the that we should think about the political stability with, because the political stability will always uh, bring the economic stability in your country so if we uh, politically we will not be stable uh, seriously uh, even china uh, no other uh, foreign country uh, will be interested to invest in pakistan so thank you very much i think pakistan have a huge and great opportunities in terms of uh, uh, inviting foreign investment for the need of the time is stability stability and stability thank you very much